Praise the Lord. So again, thank you for being with us. Praise the Lord. It's nice to see what the future, because I know we got some guests, and I welcome you guests, and I know you guys serve the Lord, so it's good to be together in the body, because the body is vast. This is the local, but the body is vast, and it's great to worship together. Amen. I always tell people here, nobody owns you except Jesus. So if, if you want to get double portions, hey, you can jump from service to service. It's his day. So, you know, um, we're quick to go to a buffet and have no problem going getting up one or two portions, right? And let's be real, and some of us are, are go three, four, five times, you know. And that's okay. We need to do more of that with God's word, you know. We need to get some quadruple portions, you know. And we need that to sustain us through the week. Because for some of us, the only day we can actually be in worship physically with our local body is on a Sunday. But we're not called to only be in church on a Sunday, Okay. For those who've been with me, you know I don't believe in Sunday only. Um, we can't get this location except Sunday, but I don't believe in Sunday only. You know, there's other ways to gather. You know, we can have a cup of coffee together and still gather, you know. So I want to thank you guys for being here with us. If you want to be part of us when we go bowling on our t um, April 20th, just let us know. The sign-in sheet is in the back. So we like to, every couple of months, like every three months, we gather together and just be able to have fun together, but also that's a way to invite someone who does not know the Lord to get to know, you know what? We're not always in church. We can still find joy outside the physical four walls. And that's a way to evangelize and bring someone to Christ. So, you know, for those of you who have loved ones who do not come to serve the Lord, this is a way to bring them to, to do an introduction. So April 20th, we're gonna be going bowling. Um, every first Friday, we're doing an evangelistic class, Surprise the World. That's going to be at Circle of Christ Church, Children's Church Room. So we do that every um, first Sunday. So we already had our first class, which is understanding the word bless, how to bless others. So today, I'm taking a little breather. I'm going to just sit back and enjoy it. And we have our minister, Andres, who's going to be bringing the word today. <laughs> For those who don't know, Minister Andres is part of the leadership of this church plan. Mm -hmm. He has been blessed by the Lord. And <laughs> from the very beginning, Pastor Sam had spoken to me about um, helping him understand how church structure is. Because he knows the word. It's just how to understand church structure and how he's going to eventually, if God continues leading him and then as he submits, because the hardest thing is to submit when God is telling you to go do something. That's hard to do, especially when sometimes we resist, because I told you guys I didn't want to do this. <laughs> this was all the Lord. You know, I submitted. This was not my idea. My idea was like, where do you need me to serve? I should have been more specific. <laughs> and he said, well, I need you to do this. And then um, this is where I'm at. <laughs> so God bless Andres. I know you're going to bring the word. All right. Praise God. Praise God. All right. Can I adjust this mic? Yeah, Sorry. of course. My portions are not the usual. <laughs> hey, you trying to say I'm a little short? <laughs> nah, I did not say that. You did. Um, all right. So, praise God. Good to see everybody here today. Uh, can I get an amen if you can hear me clearly? Yeah. Awesome. Praise God. All right. So, I want to start by just giving a little bit of a disclaimer. Um, and that disclaimer is this. I've been under two pastors for the majority of my life. I've spent about eight to nine years under Pastor Luis Ramos and, and currently, um, and I spent 16 years under Pastor Sam Colon, right? Uh, Pastor Luis Ramos is a very succinct and timely person, so part of me is very much that. Uh, Pastor Sam Colon had a constant battle with the clock, um, and sometimes uh, 40 minute sermons turn into two hour sermons. I would like to think that I fall somewhere in between, but forgive me if the Pastor Sam side comes out a little bit. I will try to take advantage and just respect your time here today, okay, as we go through this, okay? All right, so praise God. All right, so it's good to see everyone. The title of the sermon is this, and I'm going to start and get straight to it. It's called Living a Life of Gratitude, Beneficiaries of Grace. Living a Life of Gratitude, Beneficiaries of Grace. So we just came off of a huge week which is Holy Week, right, which culminates with Resurrection Sunday. Everybody's hype, everybody's excited, everybody's ready to go on Easter Sunday and be there in the room, everybody's picking out outfits, right? And I realized in preparing for this week, Pastor Darby came to me and it was nice enough last week to say, hey, would you take this upcoming week, right? And I really reflected on it and I was like, wow, that's interesting, right? I'm glad to take it, 
But when I thought about preachers, right, usually nobody wants like the bum Sunday after Easter Sunday. Like Easter Sunday is the main Sunday, right? And then the following Sunday is kind of like, all right, back to the regular. That's when most people take their little vacation or their break. Like I came on Easter once a year is enough. I'm going back home, right? So I got that Sunday. But as I reflected on it and prayed on it, um, I actually realized the value that this Sunday has, right? And going into last week's Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday, um, I refer to it along with my friends as the Christian Super Bowl, <laughs> right? If you think about the Super Bowl, we take time to prepare. Normally the week before, there's press conferences, there's events, there's competitions, everything swells. And then what happens? Super Bowl Sunday, the game is on. You get all-time high viewership. All of a sudden, 250 million homes are tuning in, right? And it is the Super Bowl. Easter Sunday, you get Holy Week. We amp up. We have event after event. Everybody, even your family members who don't care for church or don't respect the pastor will come on Resurrection Sunday, come on Easter Sunday, again, wearing their best suit, their best dress. They'll come color coordinated, seven members of a family wearing matching outfits, so on and so forth. And when we get there, you see a different energy in the room. And I teach discipleship with Minister Amy on Tuesdays in CCC. And in that discipleship class, we have people share, hey, I came in. For Easter Sunday or Good Friday and that was the first time in worship that I leapt or I jumped that was the first time that I really like just lost it and I started dancing like Crucita if anybody knows me. <laughs> <laughs> right. and, and if you know Crucita, Crucita is a powerful sister in Christ Crucita is the first person I've ever seen uh, get sturdy to what a beautiful name right that's a totally slow song and she is doing it right and Crucita can dance way better than I can right so, <laughs> um, but people were saying that's the first time that I experienced that or I felt like I was free enough to be able to do that and what I noticed last Resurrection Sunday as I was kind of like looking around the room and just reading the room I noticed that there was a feeling in the air of gratitude the focus was on the resurrection. The focus was on what Christ did for us. People came into the room with an expectation. I am here to worship. I mean business, right? I am grateful for what God did. And that joyful discovery from reading the room also put a burden on my heart. And the burden is this. Why then after Resurrection Sunday does that gratitude cease? Why the following Sunday do we return to being stale? Why are we so motivated to go out and minister the gospel and invite people to Resurrection Sunday to come to the Super Bowl? But when the Super Bowl is over, I don't want to talk to anybody about Jesus anymore. I'm not motivated, right? And I've been victim to that too, right? A lot of us in here have had that experience, if not everybody in this room. So continuing my little preface and brief introduction. Uh, in some ways, this sermon is very much a gospel presentation. Uh, but I think it's important that it is uh, because you should be presenting the gospel and having the gospel presented to you, if not presenting the gospel to yourself by reading the word every single day. If you wake up and go through an entire day without at one point in the day wrestling with who Jesus Christ is and what he did for you, you wasted a day. Mm -hmm. wow. Okay. Point one. And let's get the offense out the way, right? So you're going to say this with me. Point one is we are all sinners. Say it with me. We are all sinners. All sinners. All right. In need of grace. In need of grace. All right. So let's give a little context. Let's go to the book of Genesis, right? I think we're familiar for the most part with Adam and Eve, but mm -hmm. God creates man, right? And we're not going to turn to a specific verse. I'll give you a little yeah. summary. If you want to turn that to yourself and just give it a little peruse, see, you know, just make sure I'm not adding in like the New York Knicks to it. You can just... <laughs> go for it. I promise I'm not lying. Check me later, though. You know, verify. Um, so in Genesis, God creates man, and God created mankind to be in communion with him. So if we look in the book of Genesis, we see before the fall, God walked with Adam and Eve, right? Can somebody in this room, or everybody in this room, take a second, right? You don't have to close your eyes, but just ponder, right? Forget me, and think for a second about a moment that you felt the presence of God. A moment you were worshiping and you started to cry. A moment you were praying and you felt like you weren't alone. A moment somebody ministered or spoke a word to you. And for some reason, I don't know why this hit me this way. Something's happening, right? Has everybody in here felt the presence of God at some point? Yes. Amen? Yes. Amen? Yes. Okay. Now, I want you to grasp that moment. And I want you to understand that God created us with the intention of that moment being eternal. 
that we would feel that and live in that and dwell in that with him forever. Amen? Got that? All right, so God created us in that fashion. And I want to clarify that God did not create death. God did not create death. God did not create us to be separate from him, right? Our disobedience separated us from God, and the result of that choice was death. And the wage of that choice, sin, death. Amen? Okay, so in this room, you can give me an audible answer if you want. Just feel free to call out. Um, is it easy to eat well? No. No. <laughs> no, not necessarily, right? It's not easy to put down the McDonald's. It's crazy how you would think like, oh, you got to program kids to be a certain way. But if you get a, give a kid a chicken nugget and a piece of broccoli, watch the humanity come out. It's not easy. <laughs> All right. Is it easy to reserve sex for the right time? No. Nope. God told you to do it in a certain way. Marriage between a man and a woman, right? Gave you a context to do it. Is it easy not to do it? No, it's not easy. All right? Is it easy not to drink when you're depressed? No. no. Right? Sometimes we want to turn to some sort of substance that allows us to lose our capacity to think. And when I lose my capacity to think, I don't have to think about the thing that's bothering me. Right? It's not easy to not turn to that. Right? It's difficult, right, to stay away from that. So I'm going to go to some scripture, Romans 7, verses 15 through 19. So this is Romans chapter 7, verses 15 through 19. And this is the Apostle Paul speaking here. Bear with me. This is one of uh, my favorite biblical tongue twisters. <laughs> if you read this, it might be a little confusing at first, um, but I will elaborate. So Romans chapter 7, 15 through 19. I'll give everybody a second to turn there. Just say amen when you got it, so I know that you got it. Amen. All right, awesome. Romans 7, 15 through 19. All right. And the Apostle Paul says this, For I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me. And I'll pay attention to this one. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Can I get an amen if you felt like you've had the desire to do what is right, but I have not had the ability or the capacity to carry it out? Mm -hmm. And 19 says, for I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Mm -hmm. Okay? So this is difficult, right? And we go through this often, right? Paul is not alone here. This verse is something that we can all resonate with. Right. Because whether you have to make a change in some regard, let's use health for an example. That's something that I've been dealing with lately. Right. You have to make this change for your health or even the app, the alcohol is an example. Right. I'm using this thing to avoid my trouble. Right. And that's helping me not have to face it. But the thing that I'm avoiding my trouble with is actively killing me. And I know it. So why can't I put it down? Right. And I keep doing it and it has more and more of a grip of me and an addiction develops there. Right. And it becomes even more difficult. And then we need intervention from other parties. Right. That's how difficult it can get. Right. So each person, whether you're saved or not, has to carry the burden of sin because we are all born in sin, whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not, whether you think it's real or not, it's real. We can deny the truth. We can say it's not this way. That doesn't make the sun less sun doesn't make the sky less blue, right? The truth is the truth. And every person has to carry the burden of sin in some way, right? And in one way that we all carry the burden of sin is this, is death. So let's get a little bit uncomfortable. <laughs> so I said that God didn't create us to die, but as a result of our disobedience, separation from God happened, sin came into the world, wages of sin is death, death exists, right? Death is the unbeatable enemy of man. We see in the Old Testament that humankind has repeated opportunity to redeem themselves. We were given the chance, right? And we didn't do it. We failed every time, right? So ultimately, God had to do it himself. 
And for any of us who think here, that's unfair. Like I inherited this thing, right? Why do I have it? I didn't earn it. Each and every one of us in this room have made choices and decisions that have grieved the heart of God. And the sin that you did, that I did, is sin. It's not distinguishable from the sin of the serial killer who repented. Same sin. Grieves God the same way. Okay? So, with that being said, the person, the time that people seek faith, seek God the most, is often at funerals. How many of us in this room have been to a funeral and suddenly the cousin who's the biggest like knucklehead is all of a sudden like reading their Bible? <laughs> It happens, right? It happens, right? Um, there's a singer that I enjoy, and I won't go into too much detail, but he has a song, and he's like, when, when death happens, you've got to believe in something. Ooh. Something, right? And the singer isn't even a Christian, right? So you've got to believe in something, because death is beyond us. It's an enemy that's beyond our capacity to handle. I can't even fathom it. Really, if you think about it, right? God didn't create death, so if he didn't create death, it makes sense that it's hard for me to fathom. It's weird. I have a relationship with a person, and even just bringing up Pastor Sam, you have a relationship, and there's a relationship that exists, and then this person isn't there anymore, but it doesn't lessen the impact that they had on your life, and in some weird way, as you continue to live, and pieces of what they invested in you come out, it feels like they're still alive. But they're not alive in a way where you're speaking to them over a phone, they're not alive in a way where they're in front of you, but they're alive in that what you do is almost a testimony to who they were or are, right? So I want to give you a little bit of an example. And how many of us use Amazon in here? <laughs> we, get a package. we get a delivery, right? So when you order something online and you get it delivered to you, right, that device can be damaged in the shipping process. And when you open up that device, you see that it's damaged. Now, let's say that I decide to get like a PS5, right? I want a little PlayStation 5, I want to play my games. Like, order this PS5, it comes in the mail, it's damaged. It would be a little bit crazy to plug that PlayStation in and ask it to fix itself. <laughs> because the damage that it sustained on the way to me was not a part of its design. If the damage it sustained was a part of its design, then it would be able to repair itself. If I go to the gym and I lift weights, I'm technically tearing my muscles, right? And then I go to bed and those muscles regenerate. Why? Because that damage is a part of the design. Mm -hmm. So my body is built to recover from that. But death isn't a part of the design. So I don't have the capacity to conquer that mm -hmm. or get through it myself. But if that device doesn't have the capacity to fix the damage that was done to it, then what do we do? We send it back. And why do we send it back? Because the only one who's capable of fixing it is the one who made it. So I don't have the capacity to conquer death. I can't fix that issue. The only one who can is the one who made me. And that's going to go into point two. Point two for this sermon is a little bit lighter than the previous one. So we got through some of the hard stuff. We might, not, we might, <laughs> we might get back around to hard stuff later on. Uh, but point two, we got a little bit of a breather. Uh, and it's beneficiaries of grace. So can you say that? Beneficiaries of grace? Beneficiaries of grace. Okay, awesome. So... We know that Christ died to conquer death and offer us salvation and grace. How did he do it? So I'm turning to Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11. I'm using the NIV for this one, but it's Philippians 2, 5 through 11. While you turn there, it's also good that Pastor Darby gave the intro that he gave, because we've got quite a bit of scripture in this lesson, so I hope you're hungry. <laughs> but we we got, we got to read it. we got to have a... Uh, this is definitely more of a like meat lesson than a milk lesson. This is something that we definitely have to wrestle with, and we're going to get into the verses here. So Philippians 2, 5 through 11, when you have it, say amen. 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 Now I get to read it. All right, that was a good amen. All right, love it. All right. In your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness 
and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Right? When we read that, before I continue with the remainder of the verse, Christ could have removed himself from the cross. Christ could have called an army of angels. Christ could have exacted vengeance on the people that hung him there, which would be you and me, right? Um, but he didn't. Christ humbled himself. He lowered himself. He came and he lived in human flesh, right, with a purpose, right? God lived the life that we could not live. He died the death that we could not die to pray to pay the price we could not pay so that we could have communion with him again, so that he can reconcile us to him after our disobedience, after our sin, right? So Christ limited himself to be able to do that. Now, I do want to caution that um, some like wonky denominations will like use this verse wrongly and they'll try to say that that means that Jesus isn't God. No, there's plenty of evidence throughout the scripture that Jesus is God, right? So we'll say that this is just speaking that in certain instances, Christ had the capacity to use his divine power or divine nature to act in a certain way and he refused to do so so that he could follow through with what he was called to do on this earth. Amen? Amen. 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 So I want to give you an Old Testament example of scripture. Um, so we all enjoy the benefit of having access to God throughout our lives. So we can go home and you can pray and you can have communion with God, right? Beautiful thing. We can worship. Uh, Brother Chris came and led us beautifully in worship. We can worship the Lord. I feel your presence, Lord. You are here. You are mighty. You are moving, right? Beautiful thing. It wasn't always the case. <laughs> so in an Old Testament time, culture, tradition, God's presence was in a specific location, which was the innermost part of a tent that they called the Holy of Holies, mm -hmm. right? That Holy of Holies was adorned in gold. That gold was symbolic of God's presence being there. So a little fun fact for everyone in the room, when John is talking about heaven and he says streets of gold, the streets of gold isn't talking about literal streets of gold. Like I'm going to go in riches and gold. It's speaking that the entirety of heaven when we arrive there will be full of God's presence. God will be completely and totally present with us there in a way that we have not experienced here. Right? So to go into the Holy of Holies, the high priest would have to bring a sacrifice. That sacrifice was an atonement or a covering for the sin of the Israelites. Only if he brought that sacrifice was he able to go into the Holy of Holies and interact with the presence of God. Why? Because God is holy. God is righteous. If God is in the presence of sin, they cannot coexist. God will automatically eradicate whatever is there just by being there. Which means that there existed a time where if uncovered, one came into contact directly with the presence of God, you are dead. Mm. Sometimes we lose sight of how incredible it is that I get to go on my knees or sit on my bed and pray and that I can feel God's presence. And the only reason that you can do that is because Christ is the great high priest who offered himself as an atoning sacrifice that covered us for all eternity. So when you are in the presence of God, my sin normally would put me in a position where God's glory would smite me and stomp me out. But the presence of Jesus Christ, the covering of Jesus Christ, covers me. And then I'm able to commune with the Father. I bring up that example because, again, we have to understand the grace that we've been given in Jesus Christ. If you really want to be grateful, you have to cultivate the fear of the Lord in your life. And the fear of the Lord in our life, not to get scared, is a reverence mm -hmm. for the Lord. But sometimes saying it as a reverence, we take that as like a softball term. And we feel like it's a reverence. Okay, I revere God, right? <laughs> um, and it's really, it goes to an issue that we have. And the issue that we have is that our definition of fear in English is too simple. It's way too simple. Uh, and it's a lot more complex if you're reading the scriptures, right? So let's say this, for example. Um, would you turn on your stove and put your hand into the fire? No, right? We wouldn't do that. Because you have a healthy fear of what would happen if you put your hand into the fire. So I have a healthy fear, a reverence for the fire. I know what the fire is capable of doing. I know what would happen if I interacted with it in this way. So I will not. So in that case, fear isn't like watching a horror movie or something that's debilitating or keeping you from doing what God has called you to do. That's the wrong kind of fear. That's the kind of fear that he said I didn't give you a spirit of. Mm -hmm. 
But in that case, fear can actually be a healthy thing, right? A helpful thing, right? And when we think about the fear of the Lord, we have to have a healthy reverence for who God is. Mm -hmm. Understand how powerful God is. Understand that when you look up at the skies, God created the skies. Mm -hmm. He made that, his idea. When the eclipse happens on Monday, God made the moon <laughs> and the sun. He designed it in that way. It's crazy that at only this one point and one time, these things line up and there's gravity and everything's rotating and it's all like this big ballet. And even folks who are like atheists and don't believe in the gospel or don't believe in Jesus are amazed by how structured and how intentional the entire universe is, right? And that's by the hand of God. So that's who you're talking to when you pray. But do we revere him that way when we do? Right, so I call your attention to that. Now, this point was titled Beneficiaries of Grace. So beneficiaries, some of us might be familiar with, some more than others, right? If we're into our legal terminology and we're into preparing ourselves, right? Because a beneficiary could be associated with a will, right? In some context that we can think about it. So I'll give you a little definition. This is like the Webster's definition. A person who derives advantage from something, especially a trust, a will, or a life insurance policy. Okay, so beneficiary. So I have a life insurance policy. I actually do have a life insurance policy, right? My beneficiary on my life insurance policy are my mother and my brother. So if anything would happen to me, uh, God forbid, right? I go, money comes in, that is who that goes to, right? My mother and my brother did not earn that. I mean, not saying that, you know. <laughs> my mom raised me. Uh, don't tell her I said that. <laughs> but, but I mean, they didn't do anything directly to earn that money. They didn't work a job to earn or justify that money, right? Uh, so they're the beneficiary, right? And I'm the beneficiary on theirs as well. So, so vice versa, right? Uh, but I want to go a little deeper. And beneficiary actually comes from the Latin term beneficarius. And beneficarius means receiving favor or unearned privilege from. And if you break it down even further, it's the result of a greater person's kindness. Mm. Wow. So the greater person is good or justified. The lesser person is wrong, unjustified. And the greater person, the good person, is extending a kindness to justify the lesser person. That's where that word beneficiary comes. So what better description of what Christ did for us? Right? In his sacrifice on Calvary, we became beneficiaries of grace. We are the lesser one who is receiving the justification of the greater one. And the greater Amen. one is Jesus Amen. Christ. So when we think about the person that hurt us, when we think about the folks who we judge, because we say, you know, I'm getting my Christian walk together. You know, I'm getting myself right. I'm doing things well. This person, you know, they're a mess. <laughs> I deserve to be in leadership. I'm not any easier for Jesus to save than that person. <clears throat> I make it in my head almost like I'm easier to say. I do think I do so much right. I do so much correct, you know. And, and it's just Jesus doesn't really have to bother with me. I'm like the good kid, right? No, my sin is the same in the eyes of God as that person. Right? And that's hard to reckon with sometimes, because sometimes we don't want it to be that way. We want to take justice into our own hands. So we say, this individual is just wrong, and I won't hear nothing about it. But again, that's lacking that fear of God and that reverence for who God is, because God is the only just one. And God is the one who oversees everything and decides, right? So we got to submit to the will of God. Um, when I understand my place relative to Jesus and somewhat grasp to the best of my capacity what he's done for me I'm free to live a life of gratitude and that leads us to point three which is a life of gratitude so for this one we're going to turn to Colossians chapter 3 verses 12 through 17 and this is in the NIV version I'm reading from that's Colossians chapter 3 Verses 12 through 17. Thank you, Lord. All right, give me an amen when you got it. Amen. amen. Praise God. All right, so let's do a little uh, 
a little English language uh, vocabulary refresher. So uh, this passage is going to begin with a therefore, meaning to get the full gist of what's happening in this passage, you have to know what came before it. So to give you a brief summary, the first 11 verses of Colossians chapter 3 are talking about dying to the flesh and submitting to God. Right? So think of dying to the flesh, submitting to God, and then therefore, and now we're going to start with the second portion. So therefore, as God's chosen people, we're going to stop there. All right. Everybody in this room, give me a look for real, for a second. Say, I'm called. I'm called. That's addressing you. <laughs> right? Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy, and some people got to hear this today, dearly loved. God loves you. Let that sink in. Sometimes silence is uncomfortable, right? God loves you. Somebody in this room with this week felt like, God don't love me. God loves me. Amen. It's free. Dearly loved. So therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself. Clothe yourself. Right? When we get up in the morning, we clothe ourselves. Right? We put so much time, attention, thought into what we're adorning our bodies with. What does this mean? Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other. Somebody got bear with me. <laughs> I'm difficult sometimes. Everybody in this room difficult to you know, admit it? I'm difficult? I'm difficult sometimes. Some people got bear with me. That's Gary Bear with me a lot. <laughs> so bear with each other. And forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. That's a whole sermon on its own. But forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Amen. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. So we don't want to bypass that without acknowledging the significance of love. Mm -hmm. Genuine love. A love that comes from the Lord. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Ooh, so the peace of me? Christ. 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 Of Christ. So the peace of Christ, right there, this is why sometimes we can't do the quick read, we gotta do the slow read. But the peace of Christ, that means the peace that you're looking for, the peace that surpasses all understanding, doesn't come from me. It comes from Christ. All right, so let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Since as members of one body, you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs. So we did that today in worship from the Spirit. Singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, this is important. So here, another language thing. And whatever you do. So now this next verse is going to encompass everything that we read. So it's saying everything that you were just coming to do and whatever you do, all of it. This is the fashion that I want you to do it or the method you should do it. Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to, the God, to God, the Father, through him. So do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. So you are carrying the name of Jesus Christ. When you walk into a room as a Christian person, you are carrying the name of Jesus Christ. You are a representation of who Christ is, right? And when we do that well and we exemplify the character of Christ, it says... Do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God. So we're showing a level of gratitude, giving thanks to God, the Father through him. So your faithful carrying of your cross, your representation of Jesus, is actually your ultimate way to give gratitude to God. It's how you thank God. So how do I thank God for giving me life? How do I thank God each and every day for waking me up and blessing me? I thank him. By communing with him and representing him well and how I love others and how I interact with the world. That's how I thank him. Okay, so what do we know gratitude to be outside of, you know, the biblical text, just in general life? To be thankful, right? Appreciative for what we have, right? We get a good Christmas gift, right? I'm, I'm grateful for it, <laughs> right? I thank, I'm thankful for it. Uh, that's probably our, like, general definition of it that we're most familiar with. Um, and I also wanted to share some of the scientific benefits of gratitude, too. So hear this out, because the word of God is true. So even science has to testify to the truth of the word of God, right? So some scientific benefits of gratitude. 
Uh, it's actually been proven in studies that you cannot be grateful and anxious at the same time. Ooh. Your your mind is actually not capable of sustaining both things. Mm -hmm. So if you are in a state of gratitude, you actually cannot experience anxiety in that moment. They cannot co-populate. That's good. So mm -hmm. to be anxious, you must not be grateful. Right? They can't be in the same place. All right. Second, <laughs> people who live lives of consistent gratitude show in studies to have significantly better sleep. Significantly better sleep when they lay their head down to rest. Their sleep is sweeter, right, and more advantageous. Third, there's a marked improvement in mental health, especially depression. Especially depression. And then fourth, this is super interesting because I really like this. It's also shown in studies that people who have consistently lived grateful lives, the more grateful they are, the more gratitude they exhibited their physical health improved as well. Mm. So physical health, right? Their chances of getting injured actually lowered. Super fascinating stuff. If you really want to geek out and read it, go read it. Tons of studies on gratitude. It's great stuff. But there's a tangible effect that living a grateful life can have, right? Mm -hmm. So though that's the case, when we think of gratitude, it's probably more of a momentary thing for us. It's probably a response to something that happens in your life, right? Like you have a good moment, I'm grateful. You pass the test, I'm grateful. Uh, you get the certification, I'm grateful. The money comes in the mail, I'm grateful, right? I was in a tough spot, somebody bailed me out, I'm grateful. It's a momentary reaction. But how do we take gratitude from a momentary thing or a response to situations and make it a consistent way of living, make it breathing, make it a lifestyle, right? And this is these are three things that I want you to focus on to be able to do that and three things that I've learned in making gratitude a lifestyle for me. And one of them is this. Understand who you are. Who am I? I'm a human being, right? We said in the first one, who am I? All right, let's get back to the ugly. I like the ugly. <laughs> we are all sinners in need of grace, right? So I got to understand my human nature. We are all sinners in, in need of grace. So first thing is who you are. Second thing, uh, which Brother Chris actually highlighted in worship, who God is. So who is God, right? So uh, in discipleship, we have folks who are really like believing on the Lord to help them uh, with some issues in their life. And they were looking for specific answers regarding like the issues, like what do I do practically in this situation or the other? And there really was nothing for them to do practically. So they were looking for practical advice and the advice that um, I ended up giving, which was really like, this is what you can do, is read your scripture, but primarily read about who God is. Because what you're missing now is not a practical solution to approach this person. What you're missing right now is faith in God. You clearly, in how you are expressing this, have a lack of faith that God can do what you're asking him to do. Or he can bring restoration to the situation. Somebody in the group actually ended up sharing about their experience. And then their experience encouraged that person. Right? So on and so forth, right? So who God is, right? Read up on who God is. Have conversations. Hear testimonies about the goodness of God. Ask people who have been through similar situations. Hear testimonies about how God has come through and been faithful in those situations, right? It'll strengthen your faith and it'll enable you to look at those situations differently. So who you are, who God is, and the last thing that you're going to reflect on continually is what God did for us. And again, that's coming back to that position, that fear of the Lord, understanding who God is, what God did for us, and why we needed it. Amen? Amen. When we reflect on these things constantly, we can cultivate a life of gratitude. We can be consistently grateful. So, I want to conclude with this. Um, it's been kind of funny. I've preached, like, the last three times I've preached, it all seems to happen after major events, and it's unplanned. Like, I'll be asked to preach, and then, like, some event will go down. Uh, the first time was Pastor Sam asked me to preach, and there was this major election thing going down, <laughs> so that happened. Uh, the second time was uh, I was asked to preach, and there was a major death thing happening, <laughs> and that happened. And then now I got asked to preach, and I was like, man, God, the streak is over. Nothing really, you know, is going down. It's just a regular, you know, schmegular Sunday after uh, Easter. And then uh, New York shook for, like, four minutes. Um, <laughs> so... The streak is alive, right? I don't ask me to preach unless you want like something to go down. So, <laughs> so you know, I'm fine, just chilling on the sidelines. Don't worry. All right, <laughs> uh, but I'm just joking. All right. So with that being said, um, I'm just gonna read a, a a couple of verses, and you don't have time. You can just listen. 
So this first one is Matthew 24, 42 through 44. And it's therefore keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. Mm -hmm. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the son of man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. So Christ is coming at a time when we do not expect him, right? They get, there's ample signs that we can see in Revelation and in Scripture that can give us an idea of, like, this is what the end times look like. But I also want to share um, this, and it's that pretty much every generation of Christian from Jesus Christ to now thought that their time was the time that Christ was coming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, like, during Nero, they thought their time was the time that Christ was coming. During the Black Plague, they thought that their time was the time that Christ was coming. <laughs> I bet I haven't researched it enough to see thoroughly, but they said that the biggest earthquake in New York history was 1894. It was a 5.0, so we were just short of the all-time record. I'm sure in 1894, they also, when that happened, thought that Christ was coming. <laughs> uh, so this is a consistent thing through history. I think we emphasize it like heavily in our generations, right? And, and everybody in their time, for some reason or another, kind of like wants to like, uh, what's the left behind? Like they want to do the left behind thing, right? And, and be on the tribulation force. Um, but the truth is this, that this understanding that Christ can come at any time and we don't know when it's coming is a Christian superpower. And what I mean is a Christian superpower is this, because the Christian should be living every day with the level of urgency that you felt when the earth shook. So when the earth shook, my urgency level stayed the same. Because prior to the earthquake happening, my urgency was there. <laughs> right? I'm in the workplace. Christ could be coming every day. I don't know what time is promised to me. I don't know what's going to happen. Right, And just being realistic um, from the pandemic on, I think at this point it was like, five people that I lost like in a short span of time, right? Including some major ones, right? For those um, who know that situation, my father passed in 2021 and that was the biggest loss of my life. And then uh, Pastor Sam was also a huge one um, because with that one, it felt like kind of losing your spiritual identity and foundation and losing your pastor, right? So being through those losses, it kind of developed an understanding in me um, of every day is not promised, man. Okay. I don't know what's gonna happen, right? And I don't, I don't wanna speak negativity, but I wanna be honest and I wanna be open with you, right? We see things happen all the time. I was just watching um, Michael Strahan, you know, the professional football player? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Michael Strahan was on TV, his 19-year-old daughter has brain cancer mm -hmm. and she's going into chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. So the reality of it is, and I'm not afraid to say this, that I may not be here with you tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Something may happen to me tonight and I might not be here tomorrow. This might be the last thing that I say. Mm -hmm. right in public right mm -hmm. and I live every day with that idea that this could be it mm -hmm. right so when we're aware of that and when we think that when we feel that when we live in that way or we live the way that Christ calls us to live right and this expectation then why are you wasting time mm -hmm. the family member you've been beefing with for four years just call them tell them you love them if they're not ready to reciprocate or if they're not in a position where they want to give you that back and they want to make peace that's okay but at least you extended yourself mm -hmm. and you can go to sleep with some peace of mind that thing that you've been meaning to say, or the coworkers you have, the classmates that you have, that you want to talk to about the gospel, but you're too scared to say it, go say it. Why are we urgent about that? At the end of this life, we all have to confront the reality that we will stand before the face of God. Yeah. And we'll be judged. Mm -hmm. Some harder than others, right? Um, I'm signing up to be judged harder. So we'll still look for it. Um, when we do that, there's an eternity with God, there's an eternity without God. So everybody's going to end up in one of those. So why am I not urgent? Why am I not urgent in loving people? Why am I not urgent in sharing the gospel? Why, am I not, why don't I have an urgency in doing all these things? I should have that urgency. Um, but it's because, again, we're not reflecting on these things every day. We're not spending that time. We're not going to the feet of the Lord and going through these things every day. So we lose the urgency and we get comfortable and we settle into the pleasures of life, right? And, you know, not to berate anybody as well, but we eat the ice cream cone not knowing that there are Christians and even children like around the world that are starving. And we rest in that and we find our comfort in that. Oh, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thanks for your word, Lord. Oh, God. I don't deserve that. Mm -hmm. I don't deserve it. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know why God's been so kind to me. so kind to me. Yeah, my, my, um, my mother couldn't have children. Uh, she had a, for some know the story, but she had a child uh, before me that her and my father carried to the full nine months. Mm -hmm. And uh, she gave birth to my, my middle brother and his lungs didn't function, so they had an hour with him and they had to say goodbye. Mm -hmm. They didn't try again for six years and then I was a, I was a Valentine's Day accident. Oh <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it was a, a Valentine's Day accident that I came out. What was it? Or was it a little after Valentine's Day? No, I'm gonna tell your mother this, right? Huh? No, I'm gonna tell your mother. Oh, she tell the story probably. She tell the story probably. Uh, it was it was Valentine's Day or a little after. Dude, you can do the math, but the, the, it worked out. I ended up I was born on um, uh, two and a half months premature. At uh, eleven pounds. Wow! Right. Two and a half months premature. Eleven pounds. At eleven pounds. So the last uh, month of the pregnancy, uh, her uterus wasn't functioning properly. I was actually gonna fall out at five months wow. and die. So they uh, installed a metal rod into her, and the metal rod was to prop me up. And then she was wow. bed bound the last month with the metal rod because she was. Wow. wow. Yeah, man. So um. I say that because uh, I remember Pastor Sam in his last sermon of just preaching that he felt like his life was like a tithe to the Lord from, from his mom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I feel the same about mine, you know. So there are times where um, I wake up and I'm just like, I, I didn't really deserve a day, man. Mm. I should be on the ground with my brother, man. But, um, wow. but you have mercy on me. And I'm, mercy here. Mm. I'm here. And uh, some of us in this room have lost people. Like, I only got this amount of years. Why did this person get 50, right? I thought that about my dad, right? Um, I got 27. Why did this person get 50? Um, but I got 27. And God was gracious in that. Um, so, so we got to thank God. We got to praise God. Lord, I praise you. Thank you, God. I love you, Lord. I'm grateful for you, Lord God. I'm grateful. I'm grateful. I'm grateful. I'm grateful. I don't take this for granted, Jesus. Lord Father God. I'm grateful. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the gift of this day, Lord Father God. So, um, back to the text. When we live with an urgency, a sense of urgency, as if every day was our last, as if Christ could come at any moment, mm -hmm. um, that's when we're fully living the Christian life out to its potential. That's when we're able to really serve and impact. And um, the last scripture that I want to share is this. And it's uh, Romans 2, 4. And again, I'll read it. Now, if you want to turn, you can, but I'll just read it for you. And it's, or do you have no regard for the wealth of his kindness and tolerance and patience in withholding his wrath? Are you actually unaware or ignorant of the fact that God's kindness leads you to repentance? That is to change your inner self, your old way of thinking, seek his purpose for your life. Um, I was struck by this because it's uh, God's kindness leads you to repentance. And um, I think the earthquake, right, was an opportunity um, for some of us to jumpstart, right, to cultivate that sense of urgency in our lives. I think it was also an opportunity to reach out to other people, mm -hmm. just like COVID was an opportunity. Because again, when people get faced with death or uncertainty or situations they can't control, hearts open to the possibility of God. Mm -hmm. And it becomes a bridge. Um, but there is something that I saw um, that I've fallen in as well, um, to be transparent. But it did grieve me. And it's this, uh, that sometimes when that opportunity arises, we try to minister to people and draw them to Christ through fear of the devil. Mm -hmm. So turn to God now because the earth shook. And one day it's going to shake and you're going to die. And then there's eternal damnation and fire for you. Or turn to God now because of what the demons are going to do to you, right? Like there's this whole movement going on right now in Christianity that I don't agree with. Um, but it's focused all on like demonology and casting out demon, demon of cell phone use. And it's a demon for everything, right? And it's like, it's it's an attempt. It's easy. Fear is easy to use. Fear is, is a great tool. It's a manipulator, right? And a lot of the time when we are afraid, truly afraid of something, 
uh, it weakens us, right? And it puts us in a position that people can take advantage, right? That's why we have to kind of worry, not worry, but we have to be conscious of the news, right? A lot of the time the news is fear, right? Both sides of the aisle, right? Or fear, 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 fear. If you don't do this, everything's gonna fall apart. If you don't do this, they're coming for you in your homes. If you don't do this, right? It's fear, fear, fear. And we preach a gospel that reverences and honors the devil. And it's like, if I wanted to consume something or I wanted to be ministered to in a way that would just get me like petrified of the devil so much that I would want Jesus, I would just go like watch The Exorcist or some horror movie. You know, gotta watch Christian thing. Like go be scared of something else. Um, so this verse, God's kindness leads you to repentance because I know the moment that my life changed that I went and had or started a genuine relationship with God was the moment that I grasped his grace. It's grace. It's grace. It doesn't mean fear doesn't exist. It doesn't mean that these things aren't true. It doesn't mean these things aren't scary. But we got to remember that when we're ministering to people, if we're going to tell the truth and the scary truth, you got to couple it with grace. And really the tool that's going to help people come to the feet of Jesus and understand who God is for themselves is preaching and teaching and testifying of his grace and his Amen. mercy and his kindness. Amen. That's what affects change. So Amen. just with all that being said, again, um, I want to just remind you, reflect on who you are every day. Reflect on who God is every day. Reflect on what God has done for you. Amen. And then extend that to others and extend that with a level of urgency as if Christ could come at any moment. Amen. 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 I have to bring down the mic. Thanks, Trey. <laughs> no, but um, in all seriousness, that was a great word of God. Thank you, Dre, for being submissive to his word and allowing to be used by his word. And you know what I always tell you guys? Take notes. So I was like taking notes, you know? So um, one thing that jumped at me, and I don't know how many of you can relate to this, but there was something he said towards the end about how tra tragedy is at times, and this is what the Lord gave me, tragedy is at times a key to submission. Um, if you notice, we could be so hard-headed, so stubborn, that the Lord wants to work with you, but you're so resistant that the only time we submit is when there's tragedy. So when you lose a loved one, all of a sudden you're like, oh God, why did this happen? But you didn't acknowledge God before. It's only in the tragedy, all of a sudden you're screaming, oh God, why is this happening? Amen. Or let's say you're bedridden. Oh God, why is this happening? And you know, these are the only times that we tend to submit to the Lord. But that's not the only times you should. We see that there's opportunities. And we see one of the sections that um, Minister Dre mentioned is the beneficiary of grace. One of the things I told you is we have a great benefits package. But there's some people who go to church, they're waiting for what benefits they could get here. The benefits is when we get to heaven. Amen. We get blessings here, but the benefits are in heaven. And I've communicated to you guys, what is a blessing? A blessing is anything you can take active part of, and God uses you to bless someone else. So it's not about you receiving a blessing. Yes, you can be blessed as well. But remember, it's the activity of you being used by the Lord. And the Lord wants to use every one of us, but most times we're more about what am I getting out of it instead of blessing someone else. So if you're a Christian, if you say you profess Jesus, and you're asking, what am I getting out of it? You're a liar. You're not a servant of Christ. You're not serving Jesus. You're serving the enemy. I'm going to break it down for you right there, plain and simple. You can't serve two gods. You're either serving him or you're not. You can't walk on two sides of the street. Your legs are just not that long. Well, maybe Dre might extend a little bit. But <laughs> your legs are just not that long. So we have to understand, who are we serving? We have to be clear, direct, and transparent. And one of the things as this ministry, as the Lord used me to lift this ministry, I told you guys, when we're in community, we're being also transparent with each other. Do we have struggles? Yes. We all have struggles. But we have to be transparent that when we're in community, when we're transparent about those struggles, we help each other with those struggles. We can pray for each other. Yes, there are moments I get depressed. There are moments I get sad. But I find great joy in being with 
the other, which is being with you guys and understanding we all go through difficult times. But together, we could find joy. So those moments we go and break bread together like we've done, when we go bowling, we find joy. You know, we can't always be that person who's a sour Christian, 11 head Christian that's always like, oh, woe is me, the world's going to end. Uh, the world's already, we knew the world was going to end. The question is, what are we doing to bring people to Jesus? What are we doing with the benefits of God's grace? See, God could have forgotten about us. For those who are reading the, the word together in a year, we see the Old Testament. At any moment, God could have said, well, I'm fed up with you guys. You guys are just not working. I'm just going to eliminate you guys. Instead, what did he do? Just like the military, let's go back around again. Let's get those who are strained behind. And let's try this again. And he kept always coming back for those who were left behind. And as servants of Christ, that's our job now. You see somebody that's not here, give them a call. Come back around. Get them and bring them around again. But let's not leave anyone behind. Let's not be one of those people, you know, like when you get the benefits of getting a ticket to, let's say, Coney Island, and you know someone had one, but they lost theirs, and you're like, well, I don't care. I'm first in line. I'm getting on that side home. And you don't care that they can't get on there with you, even though you invited them, but now they can't get on with you. You just care about, I'm getting on. Mm -hmm. This is a marathon. We should be concerned about the other who's falling behind. Mm -hmm. We need to remember that. And as soldiers for Christ, we need to go back and get the other. Mm -hmm. We can't leave anyone behind. We can't be so prideful that say, well, I got my ticket. I don't have to worry about theirs. They should be worried about theirs. Because mm -hmm. let's be real. In humanity, we tend to be like that. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm covered. <coughs> you don't care about anyone else. And see, that's the world we live in today. You have health insurance. Someone doesn't. I'm covered. I don't care. I got my health insurance. I go to the doctor. Yeah, but if that person is not going to the doctor, they're not taking care of themselves. Know this. Out of your money, is eventually going to take care of them. Because if they cannot provide for themselves, we got to provide for them. So don't think that you're not going to suffer in that sense. Every two, three dollars out of your pocket is going to somebody who is not being able to be helpful to themselves, okay? So we have to prepare people to be gracious. We have to be intentional. We have to be missional. We have to go out and introduce people to Jesus. So I want you to stand up with me. If you were blessed by this message, we're going to pray with you. If you want a prayer, the altar's open. You could come up front. You could just raise your hand, whichever makes you comfortable, and we'll pray with you that the Lord continue to help you and get you through your circumstance. I'm gonna ask Dre to come and pray, and I'm not gonna say the name, but I know because somebody got left, got lift up and then sat down again. <laughs> I'm gonna have Dre pray with you, okay? Dre, I want you to pray with her, thank you. CJ, stand up, go ahead, and we'll pray with you. And if there's anyone else, feel free, but we're gonna pray together. Lord, Father God, we stand here before you, Lord. We thank you for this beautiful message, Lord, that you continue ministering to us, but that you also help us to minister to the other, Lord, that you help us continue to be intentional, Lord, that we always put you first, oh Jesus, Lord, but that we never forget the other, Lord, Father God, that we put ourselves last, Lord, Father God, that you help us continue to walk in your grace, Lord, that you continue to be beneficial to us, Lord, that you help us continue to serve you, Lord, for your glory, Lord, not for ours, Lord, that you continue to help us be the word that people see, Lord, that we be the living word, the testament to those around us, Lord, that we transform atmospheres, Lord, Father God, that we bring joy to others, bring comfort to others, Lord, only through the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, that we not be prideful, Lord, Father God, that we understand that we are submissive to you and that you are using us by your grace and mercy, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for this time that we are gathering together, Lord. We thank you for all those who can make it here today, Lord, that you continue to guide them in your word, Lord, that you continue to help them grow, Lord, in spiritual maturity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen. amen.